We launched. Thank you. So I'm Paul Bissex. I'm an expert public presenter, which is why it only took me 15 minutes to get my slides up on the screen. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, testing Python applications. In my world, that means web applications. Um, Python is getting a lot of traction these days in some other areas like data science um, and natural language processing and other stuff that isn't web-based, but um, it's also got a big footprint in the web, and that's where I've been uh, doing my thing for a long time. Um, I wrote one of the most popular uh, Russian books on the Django web framework. I didn't write it in Russian. This is just the, the weirdest translation that came out of my book, so I like to bring it around. It's a guy wrestling a snake, because that's what you're doing when you're web programming in Python. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll give you a little sort of two-minute resume to get a sense of where I've come from and what it, in, experience informs what I'm going to talk about and then get into testing. And I'll, uh, I like to hear from people who are in the room too about sort of where you're coming from and what your interest is, experience, what you've seen, haven't seen, and stuff like that. So um, my two-minute resume, here's a bunch of the stuff I've worked on. Um, way back in the day, I was a uh, freelance web dev, which I really <laughs> liked. I loved the lifestyle. I was great at the uh, product and terrible at the operating the business part, so I moved on from that to get a, a real job. Um, but I did some things. Like I worked with the National Yiddish Book Center uh, on their site for many years, who are a really favorite client of mine, um, and helped them when they raised $25 million and were ready to move on up, help them find a, another vendor. Um, and if you operate a lumber kiln, my brother makes this product that uh, saves heat from the, from the drying process to lower your energy bills. So talk to me afterwards. Um, my real job I got was at the Hallmark Institute of Photography, um, which is now closed as of uh, 2016. They, they went under. Um, but at the time, they were, they were booming. And it was fun because I got to teach web design, but also build all the stuff the school needed, um, the marketing website, but also web applications like that alumni site. And they wanted people to be able to find each other by their region, where they were, or post jobs, or um, sign up for work that was being offered to Hallmark alums, um, and share their work, and et cetera. And um, so that was fun because I, I had total freedom to choose my tool set. And 2005 was the year that Django came out. Um, and I had been looking around. I decided that PHP wasn't going to cut it for what I was doing. And I was looking around for a Python web framework. And there were many of them back in the day. Nobody remembers most of them now. Subway, they basically everyone wanted to be Rails, right? Rails had come out the year before, and everybody wanted to be the Rails of Python, and so, blam, there was a lot of turbo gears. Some of them are still around, um, but most of them are not. Python, uh, Django came out, and I was like, okay, that's good, and I used it for everything at Hallmark. Um, I ended up co-writing a book. There's an English language version with a saner cover. Um, that is still in print. I don't know why it's still in print. It came out in, 19, in 2005, and covers Django 1.0, and now we're up to about 2.2. Um, but it's, uh, it's had a, long, a nice long life. Um, after that job, I, uh, oh, <laughs> the, the school is closed now, but I got their permission to open source the uh, software that I wrote to run their, um, a lot of the internal operations, things like attendance, which had barcode scanner for student IDs, um, and an equipment loan thing was a photography school, and they had like a million dollars worth of equipment to lend out to 18-year-old students. So they had a tracking system in place, so so-and-so dropped this, or uh, this is out for repair, et cetera, and um, that's all a uh, giant Django app, which I was able to release uh, open source, which is fun. And that'll, this comes back in my, uh, one of my testing topics later on. I created a paste bin just kind of on a whim, uh, in 2006 because pastebin.com was really flaking out and I was spending a ton of time in the Django IRC channel and we were trying to share code and talk back and forth and pastebin.com kept going down. I was like, I could write a pastebin in Django and I did it and it worked and we kept we started using it and then one day I, uh, I logged in and saw that it had become the official pastebin of the channel and later on it became the official pastebin of the web framework. So if you get an error page in your Django server, and there's a button that says, share this traceback on a public website, that goes to my site. So that's sort of my, my public service I do for the, the Django community, is I keep this thing running, because that's where those tracebacks go. 
Um, it's kind of weird that it's just some random guy out in Western Mass who runs that thing that would just throw an error if, if I, I shut it down tomorrow, but I, I work hard on keeping it up and uh, useful. Um, so it's kind of a fun thing. I, don't, I have a full-time job. I have seven-year-old twins. I'm married. I have a 100-year-old house. I don't have a lot of copious free time for side projects, but I've held on to this one because I'm, I'm fond of it. Um, I co-wrote a book, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, my two co-authors, one of whom, one is the maintainer of Fabric, which is a Python automation uh, tool set, and the other wrote uh, the big fat uh, core Python book. Um, and so that was his thing. I worked briefly for an auction startup until they imploded. Um, that was kind of fun um, because it was very, uh, a, lot of, a lot of neat front end stuff. Um, but yeah, they went away. Um, and then I got a job with a gigantic media corporation um, Cox Media Group. Um, they don't have much of a footprint in the Northeast, so they're not a very well-known name, but um, down there. They own the biggest Atlanta newspaper, television station, and radio station, um, and they're in another, a number of other markets. They have about 100 properties, and we built a web publishing system that all those properties use. So if WPXI needed a website, they already had one, of course, but they got onto the platform, and then they could share their weather forecasts or school closings or uh, news and staff and yada yada, um, and that that in-house platform replaced a number of third-party vertical market things like everybody in newspaper used from one vendor, everybody in radio used from another, TV another, and the company wanted to get all that in-house so they could control it better. Um, so that was fun, and I learned a ton at that project. It was a very it was a large shop for a while, um, and they were. They were hiring so fast that um, I got the job, even though they're in Atlanta and I'm here a thousand miles away, because they ran out of Python and Django developers in Atlanta. And th I had applied for the job on a previous job search, and I talked to the hiring manager, and he said, I'd love to hire you, but I don't have the go-ahead yet uh, from the execs to hire remote employees, and you aren't looking to move to Atlanta. The next year, I was looking for work again, and a recruiter called me and said, I have this opportunity, blah, blah, blah. And as soon as he said, I said, I know that job. Here's my stuff. Like, I'd already done the code challenge, and I, was, I had all the materials to submit. And I said, run with it. And he did. And, and uh, they were like, yes. And they had since gotten the authority to hire remote employees. And so I got in. But that, by the end of that job, it was about half the engineering team was uh, not in Atlanta, which was fun um, and, and instructive. Uh, after that job, I, uh, I got picked up by this outfit. Uh, Lionbridge is the world's largest translation company. Have you ever heard of them? Me neither. Uh, yeah, okay, somebody has. Sometimes software developers have because like the only person I've talked to about the job who would ever heard of them, it runs a game development shop. And so they use Lionbridge and other companies for translating content. Um, and we ran the company, the company at large, it's a $500 million company that does, like makes big contracts with UPS or FedEx or Microsoft or whatever to translate you know, all the manuals, documents, et cetera. But this project was an API that let them sell these services more a la carte. They were, their traditional model was giant multi-million contracts. This is, I have 200 PowerPoint files that I need to have in Turkish and Spanish by next month. Here they are. Um, and then that got piped into the giant enterprise translation system that the human translators actually used, but our front end dealt with the document processing, routing, and uh, the, the commerce part of it. So that was fun. It was basically, an, the entire thing was, despite this browser view, was basically just an API. Um, and it was built for integration with content management systems on a corporate side, so Airbnb, like plugs it into their thing, and then if people want to translate their Airbnb description, there's some widget in the company system to pipe the job over here. So that was fun. Um, I always like doing things that are growing in the company and are valuable. And now I work for Mass Challenge. How many people here have heard of Mass Challenge? Startup Accelerator based in Boston. All right, that's pretty decent. Um, I had never heard of them, but uh, more people in this sphere have sometimes because you've got business ideas or you have done startups. I talked to one person who had, who had been through the application process more than once with Mass Live and uh, with Mass Challenge and another uh, person who was gearing up to do. He's like, as soon as our patent comes through, going in. So what it is, it's a startup accelerator family 
that's based in Boston. The headquarters are in Boston, and the original program was in Boston, and the Boston Accelerator is still the biggest, but we also have programs in Texas, in Mexico, in Jerusalem, in Switzerland, um, and shorter term ones, those are the permanent ones, there's also shorter term ones in uh, various places where we're seeing if there's a fit. So county court, they want an accelerator, or Prague wants an accelerator, and so they do a two week program, that's sort of a mini version of the, the full thing, and see how it goes. And if the government's like, yeah, this is part of, good part of our economic development initiative, then they would fire up a longer program. But um, the product I work on is, we call it Accelerate. It's the web application that runs the Accelerator process. So everything from applying to the Accelerator to getting judged online by the experts who are going to be the determiners of whether you get in or not, live judging where the, you're in a room pitching to a panel of judges and they're putting in feedback, that's our application. The processing of that, the, the distilling of that into reports that the execs use to determine who gets in. Um, and then operations within the accelerator, you get in, you have four months of access to our network of thousands of mentors and experts and you might schedule office hours with some of them through our platform. And then at the end, there's reporting because the the main thing sort of that the accelerator gives startups is that that networking, that access, and uh, there's also a lot of the programming things that you're learning about marketing and uh, hiring and <clears throat> sales and venture capital, and so there's all that stuff that happens too. But then at the end, they also give away uh, there's cash money given out at the end too, and so the platform is collecting information about the startups and their activities during the cycle so that the execs can decide at the end who, who's sort of made the most of it and has the best prospects for large impact in the world and has the best prospects for success in their in their business area. Um, so that's what I do now. That's the screenshot over there. It's, you know, logos of alumni. Um, and uh, it's fun because startups are um, exciting and risky, and I don't have the stomach for actually doing that kind of thing, but I love seeing people do it who are doing it well, and that's so why I get this amazing sample, right? 2,000 startups apply to, let's say 1,500 apply to the Boston program alone, 128 get in. So that's a that's a, quite a filter, which means the people I randomly bump elbows with when I'm in Boston saying, hey, what does your startup do? They're doing something super cool um, because they, they know what they're doing, they have a good team, they have a good market opportunity, they've They've got good, whatever, they're, they're, oh, and that's why we don't have coffee in there. Nothing terrible happened, but if anybody has any tissues, funny how there's no tissues in this. Who's the guy? Oh, we got some. I got them. Sorry. Is that going to be enough? Yes, it is, actually. In the right there. Thank you. No, this is actually enough, um, but uh, but thank you very much for leaping into action. Sorry about that. That's that explains the wisdom. The rule. Phew. All right. There we go. Drama over. So it's fun seeing uh, what people are doing in the in the space. Um, so that's my, that's my resume. That's where I come from. And all of those, most of those projects were similar in that they were big web applications that were critical to the business. Um, they weren't a product, uh, in the sense of something that was sold, but they were, um, I've learned called a product in terms of the type of job. My job was to maintain the product, um, i.e. The, the core functionality that, that made the business, you know, let, it, let the business do its thing. Um, so automated tests, why do we care? They save us from a lot of potential pain. Um, preventing bugs from coming back is a big one, regression tests, so that you fix a bug, but you don't just fix a bug and say, hey, we fixed that bug. You fix a bug and you put a test in that will make noise if the bug comes back, um, which happens more than, more than you like. Uh, depends against future mistakes. That's where somebody's like, oh, why is this here? This is, I'll just delete this, or um, this doesn't need to have so many of these things, or whatever. Um, showing how the code is supposed to work, that depends a lot on how 
careful you are about writing the tests and how much you care about that aspect. Some people write tests, it's kind of a write only thing. They, they test something, they pass, and no one ever looks at them again, or if they do, they don't really know what it's doing. I'm not a fan of that approach because I think, for one thing, you put a lot of effort into writing and maintaining tests. You just, if you get serious about it, it becomes a big part of what you do. So you might as well use what you know about making good maintainable software in your tests. They don't have to necessarily be at the level of your production code, um, but if they can be read to understand what's being tested, that's a great benefit when they start failing. Because somebody is gonna have to go back into that test a year from now, two years from now, and figure out why is it suddenly failing. Is the test just outdated? Did something change that the test is not up to date on and needs to be fixed so that it now has the correct assumptions? Is the test obsolete because it's, it's looking for something that isn't a functionality that's there anymore? Um, was the test too fragile so it was it's failing to test the thing it was supposed to test because something in its environment happened that really shouldn't have affected it. The more readable the tests are, the more easy it is to answer all those questions. And they make development faster by reducing fear, and that's a huge one. When I join a project, the first thing I want to know is how do you have a test suite? Um, and it's a great, for those of you on the job market, it's a great interview question for you to ask the, the potential employer is, what's your, what's your testing, what automated tests like on your system? Everyone will apologize that they're not doing enough or they're, you know, they, <clears throat> they uh, wish they would do more. Um, that's a good sign that they, they value it enough to be embarrassed. Um, but it's, it's good to hear about sort of how they do it because sometimes you might hear something like, oh, well, we, uh, it's, it's really mature code, so it doesn't really need tests. That's great if it never, ever changes. Uh, and I'll talk about the kinds of change that can uh, be caught by tests because it's, it's not just about what you've decided to do. Um, so um, <clears throat> I said I have seven-year-old twins, and they're big Star Wars fans. So I did share this slide with them. I didn't make them see my whole talk, but I was like, so I'm going to give a talk, and it's about testing because if you engineer something very carefully, but you don't test to make sure it really works, somebody else might find it. Or, you know, it's not always uh, rebel scum. It's sometimes uh, just the forces of entropy. So, um, but there, there's, there's certainly, you know, security problems that arise as well. Um, so I want to jump into uh, a couple um, detailed run-throughs of testing tools in Python and how I've used them and sort of what the key pieces are. Um, who here is uh, working in a Python code base now? All right, cool. Um, and uh, so for those of you who, who are, some of this may be familiar to you, this is all the unit testing stuff which I'm about to get into, all the sends from uh, the, the uh, Kent Beck and the sort of small talk era software giants that really informed a whole lot of what's turned out to be great common practices or growing practices in uh, software today, the unit test libraries for Java and Python and pretty much everything are all modeled after this thing they wrote for Smalltalk in, in the 80s, I believe. Um, and so they do very similar things. They, they set up the state of the world enough so that you can make an assertion. You can say, I'm going to assert that these two things are equal. That's one of the most common ones is after this, if I hit this view where I have added a new startup, the latest added startup value should be the same as my startup values had. See if A and B is equal or if they're not. See if things are, are true or false. Um, that might be values in, my, in our world. It might be, is this program active or not? The date it starts is in the future, so it should not be active. So I'm going to assert true or assert false on the method that checks whether it's active. Um, so you set up your conditions and you make assertions, and then you get reporting on that. Um, so when all is, all is good, it looks something like this. This is a tail of the console output from a test run on my paste bin. Um, in my course, in my, my talk description, I said code bases from 1,000 lines to 300,000 lines. My 
my paint spin is in the hundred in the thousand to two thousand line code lines of code size not very big um so some of the my examples are drawn from it because it's a more manageable thing it's got about 70 or so tests and this is a verbose output of every one of those tests here the here the test method names bing 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 and okay means the test passed so at the end it's not saying there's any errors or failures so that's good that's what i want um that's not always the way the test run goes Sometimes it looks more like this, and this is really where the tests are proving their value. Um, with the pace spin, like I said, I have very little spare time um, to work on it, but I've done a couple rounds of sort of big upgrades that I take a long time to do because I have small slices of time, but some of them have been significant changes to the architecture of the app or changing the version of the framework of the framework it runs on or changing the version of Python that it runs on, which are very disruptive changes. <clears throat> Having a test suite is the only thing that made me able to do that. The, um, uh, the last set of changes I did to the pace bin, which have not yet been, been released, were upgraded the version of Django from, I think, 1.6 to 2.1, let's say, like a, a big leap, that one to two, there's a lot, of, a lot of APIs change in there and upgrading the version of Python from 2.7 to 3.6, um, which, and Python 3 is really kind of a, a more different language than uh, sometimes you get in, in the evolution of languages. So lots of stuff breaks there too. I just said, hey, run this, run my test suite. Here's a new version of Python. Here's a new version of Django. Let's see what breaks. Everything broke, um, but that's my to-do list, right? <clears throat> Instead of having to wonder whether I caught everything, I just keep going until my, my tests all pass. These are the last two that are failing out of the, out of the suite. So I've got uh, one that tests. Basically, um, if one of the things you can do in my paste bin is you can change the when your item expires. So if you initially, you set it to be one day, and then you're like, oh, I need that up for a week, you can go back and change that uh, on it. If you're authorized, and this, this test checks to make sure that people who aren't authorized can't do it. So you're supposed to get a 403, which is what? HTTP 403. Yeah, did not. That's a that permission error. Instead, it's getting 200, which is okay. okay. <laughs> not the response we want. So that's the failure. And uh, uh, the other one is I was doing a an assert true. Like I mentioned, some of those are useful. Um, this is each user has a history page. That says here's the things you you put up, and this the test makes a new item under that user's account, and then the test after creating it. Makes wants to know that the item is showing up in the list of recent items, and it's not, and so that test is failing. So, two failures out of my seventy or so. So that's my that's my to do list, um, and this is how from the unit test uh, framework. This is how the output looks. Every dot on the top there is a passing test. F is a failing test, and if there were test errors, there would be E's for the test errors, and um, if you make a change that was maybe disruptive in a way you hadn't planned, um, instead of dot, 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 which is what you want, you say F, 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 which is what you're saying as you're watching your tests run across the screen, because that is not what you were hoping for. Um, I'm just going to run through. Any questions on that so far? I'm going to get into some, some specific tools and techniques. No, thanks so much for showing that. That's great. No, no problem. I'm, I'm happy to. And I'm, um, Just let me know if there's details, because you know we have only so much time, and I can sort of get up to speed sometimes. Um, I don't want anybody to, I don't want anything to get lost because I forgot to put the context around something. Um, I wanted to mention a few things that I think are good to know about when you're writing tests. One is mocking. Um, ideally, your unit tests aren't requiring a lot of stuff to be available outside of the code of the application like databases, like network access, like file systems. Um, in rare cases, you, you do need to test those things, but most of the time, that's a, that's a smell in your test. That if you're, if you're making um, network calls, let's say, or hitting file system, that you're, you're testing too much stuff. Like, you don't need to test that the, that the system on which your application runs can make a request over the internet. You're, you're going to need to trust that that's not part of your application's 
logic. Your application is not responsible for that. That's the host, and it's got its own mechanisms for ensuring that that works. The reason we use mocking is sometimes we have code that, that does some of those things, and we want to test it anyway. This is a test that is checking to make sure something gets logged in the appropriate way when it happens. So we could run the application code and then find where the log file is on disk and then access it and read it and, and parse it. Um, but that's slower and we may not have, our test runner may not have the permissions to look at that file and then it blows up with an error. We don't need to touch the file system. We just patch the logger and then we set things up as we would and we check to see if our pretend logger that we created via the patch command, the patch decorator, received the message that we expected it to receive. So here's what this means. Um, and this is, this is pretty much real production code. I, I took out some things that were distracting and not relevant, but um, the key, the two key pieces about mocking that are uh, different, make this test look different than uh, your typical unit test is the patch decorator. So this is the at symbols is a Python decorator, which means take the function that follows this and wrap it in this function. So it's, it's basically taking the function and enclosing it in something that messes with uh, what the function <coughs> receives or returns. And then with that decorator comes an extra argument. That decorator inserts one more argument into the function call. That's part of what the wrapping uh, entails is normally um, this, this would just be a typical Python method signature self, which is your, 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 your this uh, in Python, but it gets another argument which is the mock logger. That's key because that's what we need to do. We need to um, check whether that mock logger was called with a certain message. So this is a bit verbose and doesn't quite read like English, but once you know what it's saying, it makes sense. This is down up, up to here is um, set up and gets an application and, and adds an answer to the application. And this constructs the expected log message that we want to see. This line right here is checking did the mock logger receive a warning with this string as the text? And um, if the answer is not yes, the test fails. This test has a bad pattern in it, which I uh, call out when I uh, sort of run down some things at the end. It's making two different assertions. It's not obvious because their form is different, but ideally each, each test, each test method in your, in your test class should make one assertion at the end of the, end of the body of, of the method. So this one sneaks in too because they're related, um, and if, if either one of them fails, then this thing isn't working as it's expected to, but really this should be two separate tests, even if they share some setup code. You can refactor that and have a helper method or a setup method that, that does the necessary prep. But really, this we should have one test method that ends with this assertion and one that ends with this assertion. This one uh, just wants to make sure that the ID of the answer that was created up there uh, is not in there because uh, <coughs> they didn't. To comply with the, the uh, they put in multiple answers in the question, and that's, a, that's an error. So anyway, um, the key thing there is, is the, the mocking, that we have a logger which writes the disk. I don't want my test to have to think about that. We mock the logger so that all we care about is the essential thing of the logger, which is it receives and stores text. That's what the mock object does, but we didn't have to change the code that we're calling. This patching, the decorator is here, but it's referring to a namespace that is not this test namespace. It's saying in the MC module, and it, its query set module is pretty deep path, but in there, in the application answer query set, there's an item called logger. That's what's getting patched. The, um, the patch, the mock and patch stuff used to be a third party module that everybody used. Um, now it's part of Python. It was created into Python 3. Around uh, three, two, or three, three or so. So now it's just part of the standard library, which is great because it's really kind of an essential thing for uh, writing tests. But if you're on Python two, um, you are importing it. You're, you're installing it as a, as a third-party thing. It works exactly the same. Um, all right. 
So, any questions about mocking before I move on to doc tests? It's, it can be a baffling thing, but um, in the abstract, it makes sense, right? Uh, the, the thing that sometimes gets puzzling about mocking is that long specifier of where the patch is being applied. The, um, in the docs for patch, they say they have sort of a little watch word about it, um, which is more or less you, you apply the patch where in the namespace where the object is being used, not where it's defined. So you're not patching the Python standard library that contains that logger uh, module. You're patching the namespace in your application that has imported it because that instance of the logger object is what you want to replace with your mock. So that's the, and the documentation doesn't sidestep that issue. It's, it's, um, it's pretty common to trip over it, but when you get it right, you, you know because your, your test does the thing you expect. Um, so doc tests are a thing. Has anybody heard of or even used doc tests? So this is a thing, I don't know where this came from actually. It's big in the Python community, but I don't think it was created uh, in Python. Closure has them, I know, for one. They're not just a Python thing. Um, doc tests are this neat thing that comes, Python has a, has a bias towards readability um, and Every Python method or function or class can have something called the doc string, which is a block of arbitrary text at the head of it, below the below the, the definition line and before the body of the function. That says what it does. You can say whatever you want, but typically it says what it does in in English. Um, people use documentation generators to extract those strings and then build clickable documentation for their app. But the other cool thing you can do with doc strings is you can insert what basically look like captured interactive sessions with Python and have the test runner check to see if the results are true. So this looks like, okay, here's what I did. I used this thing. This is a snippet of code from the photography school operations app. Um, and so that's why there's cameras and lenses and all these things. So this just shows like, here's, here's how we create um, uh, item type called camera and item type called lens. Um, and then here's how we add things to the inventory. And then here's some methods that we can use on that inventory. For example, the camera object type, how many are in stock? There are two. How many lenses are in stock? One. So we, we the, the test, so this, this shows us, you can read this and see, okay, I, I see how, you know, these Python statements or expressions yield these output. But the test runner actually runs these things around the next to the, the carrots, and if, they, if the test runner doesn't get this, the test fails. So you've got something that's both documentation and automated tests. Um, I became an extra uh, renewed fan of this when I was um, taking a look, when I got the green light from the school as it was shutting down to open source this. I hadn't touched it uh, in years. Um, I, I left there in 2010, and it was 2016 or so before um, I got to release this. So things were, this was ancient code to me. I didn't understand much about it, but I had done this sort of documentation all through it and it all made sense again. I was like, all oh, right, there's this thing and that thing and the other thing. Um, it's work to write this stuff because you want it to be mostly aimed at humans, but test things that are important, um, which means sometimes you can't do all the sort of setup and fine grain stuff you'd like to do, but you have other tests for that. This is double header. It shows people how to use it, shows the, the data relations, and if something changes that that asserts, it will actually blow up. Um, you can also run your doc tests. There's two ways to run doc tests. One is um, you can have your unit test runner pull them in. So this is what I use in my, in my basement. It's just a, it's basically a, a one-liner that adds the doc tests from this module, which included that uh, some tests of the of the models in that case bin, and returns it. This is this is just a method that the uh, the unit test framework. It's a magic method. So if it sees if it finds this method, it uses this to find where the tests are. And so this this module test doc strings has this method so that the runner knows what tests I'm running when I run test doc strings. You're going to run all the doc tests that we find. Um, and 
they look like uh, the stuff on the right. Um, again, just like the, the camera example, this shows you know, confirming things like if I create a new, so the, the first two lines are just set up. Make a new paste bit, that's an item in the paste bin, and it's got some arbitrary content, and save it. I didn't set the syntax when I created it, but the syntax should be plain text. Okay, good. I didn't set the expiration, but it should be seven days. That's good. Um, nothing should explode if I pass in non-ASCII characters. That's an important kind of test to do these days, because people will do it for you, either just throwing garbage in or by speaking a language that has accented characters. Um, and the primary key is generated automatically, but you should be able to override it um, by setting it on the save method, and we confirm that it's there. So these are all just niceties, both reminders of what methods and functionality the object is expected to have, and they are always executed on every test run to confirm that none of the assumptions have been violated. Um, and there's, there's a pattern that's worth knowing about if you write standalone Python files, which is what I call self-running doc tests. So this is a, sort of extracted from a module of helper methods. Um, and this crazy code I stole from uh, Stack Overflow or something. But um, it's, it turns numbers into things that sound more like uh, have units that you are expecting. The thing that makes it auto-running is this. <clears throat> In Python, there's this dunder name magic attribute, which is the name. <clears throat> um, it, it's it's dunder main if the script has been called from the shell. If it's been imported, that's not the name, and so it won't run. What this means is, if you run the script, it will run its own tests. So that this this is a, this is a top level in the file, and so the the file executes Python modules execute when they're imported also, so you need to be careful about what your top level logic is, but this is a no-op if it's imported because name is not equal to under main in that situation. But if you just run it from the shell, if you type you know, dot slash and human bytes or whatever the name of this file is, it will run. The under name will be main, and it will run the doc test. It's imported doc test above. Doc test test mod means find every doc string in this file, look for tests, execute the tests, and report on the results. So that's your one liner. So if you have a, a standalone Python script and there's something about it that you want to make sure works through future changes, um, that that uh, if name pattern is, is your key to that behavior. Um, all right. This is something, all right, this is something that I should probably be slightly later in the uh, in the talk, but it it does raise an important distinction in the in the unit test that you run into pretty fast, which is um, you want to sometimes check to see if something raises a particular exception or doesn't raise a particular exception. Often this happens when you are um, fixing a bug. So you discover there's a bug where if such and such a value is empty on this certain function, the function can't handle it and blows up and raises a particular exception. Um, I work with this challenge a lot in my, my current job. The, we have an application that's about 100,000 lines of code, the core of which was written uh, five years ago by a small number of people who are no longer with the organization and weren't really equipped to write something of this, of this scale. Um, they, they did a great job. They were smart, talented, but um, they were not writing for the ages, uh, and they were not, I think, they were writing a, a proof of concept more than a uh, production application. And so we have a lot of situations in the code where something an end user does can trigger a 500 error in the application, which in my book is a big no-no. No user input should not be able to essentially crash your application. Um, it's not uncommon. Uh, for us, it's getting less common. It's one of my things I, I harp on and nag people about. But when you're you fix one of those bugs, you want to put in a test that says, make sure that when this input comes to this function, this error does not arise. So on Stack Overflow, you can find people asking this. Um, <clears throat> and so how, how do you check on this? Um, there's an example from, from uh, Ruby. Any Rubyists in the room? 
No, Ruby used to be so hot. Mm. Um, so on that Stack Overflow page somewhere, somebody's saying, just call the function, and if it raises the error, then the unit test for framework will report it. This is true. Like I said, when you're doing your test run, you get a dot if the test passes, you get an F if the test fails, and you get an E if the test raises an error. That should be of an abnormal state, more abnormal than tests failing, the error. <coughs> error means there's something wrong with your test. It's not robust enough to handle um, the situation. So what can we do to, to be a little bit more uh, fine-grained about this? There, here's, uh, here's sort of the base, base point. So I, this is a, a sort of crib of a real test that we were writing to regression test a bug that happened. And if the, if the search function called with a negative number, we don't want it to blow up. We found out that it exploded with a negative number. Um, so this is the bare bones. If this test, if it's okay to call with a negative number, the test will pass. If it's not okay to call with a negative number, i.e. if that get search method throws an error, the test will blow up with an error. The test will not fail. There's no fail um, because error is different from fail. Yeah. Could you could you do a um, could you suppress and then catch the uh, the exception? Try catch is definitely the way to go, um, <clears throat> and so rather than you don't need to suppress it actually, but the, the try block effectively does. It, so when you say try, it well, that's hidden in context lib. Like no one uses that. I was I was trying to answer <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. So um, so we try this thing. And if an exception is thrown, then this except clause can check it. And I, I'm specific about what exception it is that I'm, that I'm looking for. So if we get this grouped entity that does not exist error, which is what this target method throws, if it gets a negative number, we know <coughs> our bug has arisen again, and we fail. Um, so this is the message. The test will fail. It'll show up as an F. And this will be the text that is in the detail of the test failure. One of the reasons this is better than just it'll throw an error and we'll, we'll notice it, but we won't miss it if we just let it throw an error. That's true, but you won't know the manner in which the error arose. You won't know what error it is, um, or you won't know why it came up. This is looking very specifically for an error we know is associated with the bad behavior we eliminated, hopefully forever, <clears throat> and we give this readable message if the error is encountered. If some other error arises because something else of the many things that could make that function go wrong changed, we'll just get a straight up E, and that's our alert that something is broken in our tests that shouldn't be. That we're this is a this is a situation, this error is something we we want to catch, but it's we know how it happens. Whereas a syntax error or who knows what else, other error that could also um, cause an E in your test output is not not at all related to this business logic, we want to catch that. We want that to be its own sort of red flag. So this is the, the way you handle that situation. I mention this because you know how it is when you're trying to solve a problem and you search for it and you come up with Stack Overflow pages and somebody's asking the same question you asked, but there's no answers. Um, that's more or less how I got to this point. <laughs> um, so my answer is now on that, uh, on that question. Um, <clears throat> I got a funny case study about um, bugs that, uh, that elude tests. And this is drawn from real life last week. The bug is the thing at an angle. Um, and that's my, that's my avatar in there, our bug tracker at work. Um, the staff of the accelerator have a support page for they can view startup status. And among the things, um, we have this thing called startup statuses, which means they applied for Boston in 2017. They applied for Boston in 2018. They were a finalist in Israel in 2019 it was discovered that only one of those statuses was being displayed on that page, no matter how many they had. Um, so they might have been, they might have been a, uh, a finalist multiple years, or they might have been an entrant multiple years, and the, only the, the oldest one was showing up. Um, so I picked up that bug and started digging in. And so I, I was looking in the relevant code, and um, I found this, there's a couple helper functions of this sort that were uh, designed to extract the, from the database the statuses related to the startup. 
who was being examined. And I looked at this last line. First of all, any of you, you uh, <coughs> Pythonists, can you, can you translate, what, what is this syntax that's being used there? Because it's unusual. That's a ternary if. Yeah, so there's, there's a ternary conditional return, right? It's going to return the first item of the current status of query set if there's anything in the query set, or it's just going to return the empty query set. Why would you need to do that? You're going to basically return what amounts to an empty list, if the list is empty. You're going to return just the first thing in the list, if the list is not empty. Screw the other things in the list. I, so I saw this and I was like, why is that? And I asked, I asked the uh, engineer who worked on it if he remembered. And he, uh, he, didn't, he didn't have anything that he remembered about why it was like that. So I just I kept digging. Um, and the next thing I found was the, the, the code that calls the helper. Um, so this is the, the function building up the context to get passed to the template that includes the statuses. So it's calling the helper function here to get the statuses, and then it's assigning them to a context variable that the template gets to use to, to render. OK, so that looks basically OK, but there's something wrong in that function, which we'll come back to, that turned out to be the key. And then here's the test. Now, I see the test misses because it doesn't fail except at its job, which is to test if the startup tags are visible, right? I've said we're here because they are not visible. Um, it does the expected things. It, it makes a startup. It makes a startup status for that startup. It logs in a staff. It looks at the, the page for that startup. It expects to see that status in the page, and it passes if the test is, if the, if the status is there, right? OK, so why is this test passing despite the fact that we have a bug. Right, it's only looking for one. And that works. We verified that that works on the broken production system. One status is what you get, no matter how many are actually in the database. So I'm a nitpicker about naming. So this is where I went with this. This is the lie. This is not test if startup tags are visible. It's test if one startup tag is available and assumes that the rest are. That's a fair, it's not a crazy way to go about it. You know, where, where do you stop? What if, there, if, what if there's a problem where it only displays the first seven? Uh, so it's not a terrible sin that it only checked one, but the, the fact that the name didn't match the, um, the action was another sort of red flag to me. Um, did we get to this? Yeah, so the, um, the whole thing came down to there's something in the function that caused my colleague Asante to write this line that shouldn't have been. So he was having a problem. He solved it with this and created the book. I mentioned in the top snippet, this is sort of a Python specific thing. This is, if you're not a Pythonist, you're not going to see this thing. And if you also, if you aren't, you're going to be like, oh, what a dumb language. Does anybody see what's wrong with that top function? It's a one character problem in two lines. I missed it for half a day. And I've been using Python for 15 years. Oh, just switch friends and curlies? No. Good guess, though. It's, it's on that granularity. Oh, yeah, they're right. But no, yeah, it's, it's making a dictionary. Any other guesses? I want to say it's, it's the underscore in the current. Oh yeah, no, that's that's a basic convention that says this is a method that's only used within a function only used within this okay. module. Good guess. All right. Is it because you're not concatenating the two status lists? Good, good guess. Yeah, if that was something we were supposed to do, that would be very likely suspect. The problem is there's commas at the oh. end of these two lines. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah, because you're a Python developer. Oh. Yeah. That would be funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. So in Python, like many other languages, we have a list data type and we have a tuple data type. Does anybody say tuple? I know you can say it both ways. You say tuple? All right, maybe I'll, maybe I'll change. So um, I say tuple because, you know, quintuple, octuple. Um, tuples are generally contained by parentheses. The parentheses do not create the tuple. Commas create a tuple. So what this does is this, this is just a simple assignment. 
that creates a one item tuple with a value in it. So Asante, poor Asante was working on his code. And he's like, why is this thing in the tuple? I don't know. I'll just get it out. I'll just take the first item out of the tuple and then it'll work. <laughs> Boom, test passes, problem solved, no errors, done. Um, so my, my feedback to Asante was you're moving a little too fast that day um, because you, you, you should have, your spidey sense should have been tingling when you got to this point. Um, and it eventually would have led you back to that. But it was super subtle. Like I said, it took me half a day to find that that was the problem. So the six was more or less. And, and it was consistent. He did it on both lines. Yeah, I think where this came from was it was it was extracted out of here, right? So the you're, you're uh, doing yeah. less dick building, and we, we chop them up in multi line, so it makes it easier when you change one line, and the, and the diff isn't so disruptive. So a comma at the, at the end is is pretty uh, frequent in our code base, but yeah, just uh, there it was. So the fix was remove those two commas, change this to return current statuses. And change this test so it uh, it checks more than one status. So that's my that's my puzzle of the day. We're getting close to the end. So any question on that before I jump into the sort of last practices? That was a fun mystery. Um, so just wanted to mention quickly some other techniques and tools that I think are useful. That are some of which are specific to Python testing, some of which are more general purpose things, but that you find yourself wanting to do. Uh, if, you're, if you're leaning on unit tests. One is find slow tests. Um, it's not hard to write a slow test if you're dealing with an application that either handles a lot of data or does a lot of intensive processing. Um, and if you've got 20 tests, you don't really care if, if one takes you know, 10 seconds, the others are fast. We've got 2,400 tests in this code base and I did some analysis, and I'll get to that later, but it's, um, there are some outliers that are, that are hogging the resources. Measure test coverage. That means use a tool that tells you for every application line of code, do tests hit it or not. You run your test suite, and the tool is, is monitoring, and at the end you get a report. All the lines of your application of this module got executed except this one. So that means anything could happen with that line, and you'd never know until it a user complained that it was broken because your tests don't check that it, uh, that your tests don't run it. Um, so measuring test coverage is one way. It's not the ultimate. If you have 100% line coverage in your test suite, it doesn't mean you can't be fooled. Uh, it doesn't mean you've caught all the possible breakage, but it's an, a really important starting point and it's a good metric to use for a team is we're gonna aim for getting our test coverage up from 50% where it is now to 80% by the end of the year, something like that, when I joined. Um, well, I'll, I'll get to that when I get to the details. Um, continuous integration. If you're doing a continuous integration flow where you're developing features, fixing bugs, and they, they merge into the main line, um, on every merge, that should be getting tested. And so if you use Travis CI or Circle CI or any number of uh, GitLab, I know now has an integrated one, um, so that when the code gets pushed from the developer's machine, the full test suite is run on it, and you get an email alert or a Slack alert or whatever you've configured to have happen. But that way, um, when you get to the magnitude of test suite that we have, which takes half an hour to run, the developer doesn't have to choose between running the tests or uh, having half an hour of their life to do something else. So continuous integration, running tests on the push is a big one. Factories are a way to generate um, dummy data that's structured the way you need it to, to be. It gets pretty tedious to in your test before you execute the code on the sample data that does the thing that shouldn't be broken if you have to spend 20 lines setting it up. And we have a pretty complicated schema in our thing where we have a, a program family like Boston. And in Boston, we have a program like the Boston Accelerator. And within the program, we have judging rounds. And within the judging round, you have an assigned judge in a startup, and the startup has a user associated with it, and a user has a has a role, and the role is associated. With, uh, and it's it, the the schema diagram is, is quite a splatter print. Um, factory can be give you a one line call that creates a judging round with the appropriate associated judges, startups, cycles, uh, etc. Without you having to copy paste that from every test or um, do some other 
sort of or bail out on it and just not test those things because it's too hard to set up the data. Yeah. Do, do you find the factories are, uh, you're talking about slow tests, do you find the factories are faster than loading a fixture? No, they're, well, I, I don't think they're significantly different. Okay. Um, the downside with fixtures is you, you're you dealing with separate artifacts that you have to maintain. Um, so, um, and just to, I know we're getting down on time here, I just want to run through the, hit the, um, pardon me, the example. <laughs> really? Right now? Um, so the this is what a coverage report looks like. So 100% is every line of that module was executed by the tests. The ones with the sub 100, they tell you what line. So you can go and, and figure out why those lines aren't getting hit. This is the same report, just in a graphical view. This is CI server output. So there's 10,000 lines of test runner output that I didn't have to wait on on my local machine. Um, but I give it, I get a red or green at the end. Um, another tip for, this is about Django specifically, test your view functions directly. You don't have to make a web request and have it go through the, the URL uh, parsing and all that stuff. You can just hit the, the view as a function. Just hit the function with a, with a made up request and see if you got back the result you wanted. You don't have to uh, do all the, the stuff in between. Middleware, there's a lot of the pretty heavy things in the stack that will make your test run 10 times slower if you don't need it. Finding the slow test, finally, this is one of my last but favorite things. I ran the this tool called Nose Timer on our test suite and got a report. These are the top slowest tests. 21 seconds is the top 10 in, in just one part of our application. Um, the stats I found were the 20% of the execution time of the full test suite was taken up by 3% of the tests. Um, so because I'm that kind of nagging guy, I wrote a ticket that said, let's make all these tests faster. Um, and let's put reporting of this type right in our build so that every time you run a build, you see what the slowest test is. Um, so you know where to focus your efforts. So I wish you all to reach at the happy place, which is green builds with no errors. Um, thank you very much for coming. And thank you for your patience with the technical difficulties and all that. And open any other questions. I know we're sort of, you know, out of our time box, but I'm happy to entertain any questions. Do you have one? No? no? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, working with Django, is there a way to test or find bugs in your template code? Great question. Um, the, the smug answer is don't have business logic in your templates. Um, okay. But, you know, that's not real. Um, in short, it's, it's doing what I said you should avoid often, which is exercising the full stack. So one of the things that hitting the view directly um, doesn't deal with is, is rendering the template. You just get back the, the data. Um, well, it depends on the, on the view. But anyway, um, basically, there's, no, there's nothing more direct than calling, calling the view and seeing whether you get an error or not. And so logic errors, it, it's, it's a pain because you're parsing text to see is the computation correct or some other thing. The, the answer that I come down to when I have something that's in the template that's wrong is, is there a, is a leverage point that's better in the code that isn't the template? Is there a, is there a helper function that's a view calls that produces the value that turns out to be wrong? Or is, is the logic in the template too complicated and should be extracted to a template tag and then I can test? We definitely have template tag tests. Um, so yeah, it's, it's more of a choose your refactoring um, to solve that, but there's no, I don't have any, I don't have any tools that make that um, more pleasant. It's a good question. Yeah. Do you have your slides anymore? I want to show someone that <laughs> uh, I don't, but I could share them. I, um, yeah. You just want to send the bug you in just that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the bug is a fun one. All right. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank you all again for... Uh, for coming. If you have a startup idea and want to pitch to Mass Challenge, uh, come get my discount code so you can do it for cheaper. <laughs> I encourage anyone who's crazy enough to have a startup to apply to Mass Challenge. They just want to give you stuff. So.